just uh, we don't expect uh, our visitors to give, but if you'd like to, um, we've stopped uh, passing the plate uh, since COVID, generally speaking, except for a very few exceptions. And so we have a plate out in the lobby if you'd like to give, but as I said, there's certainly no obligation and we're just happy that you're here today. So today we're going to uh, read from Psalm 139 at the New Living Translation. And uh, as you hear these words and read the, the words that are bolded there, um, just think about how much the Lord is watching over you, how much he knows and how much he cares. You are not alone. Oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know my heart. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me, and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me, and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They all number the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. <clears throat> well, we're going to talk, as I mentioned earlier, about baptism. And, um, uh, we don't have a uh, one reading. I'm going to throw a lot of scripture out at you today, which is why you have a handout, and along with uh, some fill-in-the-blanks. So get your crayons out and uh, be prepared to... Uh, there's no test at the end, so there's that. That's good news. But, all right. So um, I don't know if you remember... Gosh... Uh, I don't remember if you remember, but about mm, 16 and a half years ago, there was a, um, a mining accident out of um, Tallmansville, West Virginia. And uh, the evening of the um, the evening of the incident, it was reported that 13 miners had been trapped. And they'd actually been trapped for what was about 40 hours in this mine and uh, out of Sago. And um, it, was, it was considered quite the miracle because it was presumed to be a near-fatal carbon monoxide exposure. And uh, so folks and families of the miners in, in the area had gathered at the... Baptist Church, the Sago Baptist Church, and they were among the first to hear the good news. And the good news was that 12 out of the 13 had survived. 12 out of the 13 had survived. And so the church bells were ringing, and even the hardened, the most hardened newscasters and the reporters were near tears upon reporting this good news as they talked to uh, many of the loved ones of the miners and awaited for their uh, glorious uh, rescue from the mine. 
And the papers, the, the papers at that time, USA Today, the New York Times, they'd been holding on, waiting to go to press to get the final story printed. And the headlines came out, miracle in the mine. Miracle in the mine. 12 miners found alive. So um, it took uh, much of the night for the rescue to go on. And as much as I love to watch the news, we all know this, I love to watch the news and I was glued to the TV. Even, even I had to go to bed because God knows I need my beauty sleep. So I, I went to bed before um, the rescue had occurred. But before going to bed that night and before this actually had uh, been on the news, I had watched a television program called Miracles. And uh, the program was hosted by Pat Robertson of the 700 Club. And I caught, I caught only the last part of it, but they were talking about miracles, and they talked about this one woman by the name of Connie Davis. And Connie Davis was literally, literally raised from the dead. So her story went like this. Connie was a mother, she was a wife and a mother of a teenage son. She had suffered a pulmonary embolism one Sunday morning, and a blood clot hit her lung. She'd been rushed to the local hospital, where for two hours, two hours, they administered CPR. That's a long time. Trying desperately just to get a pulse or a blood pressure reading, something that indicated that Connie was still in there, that she was still alive, that she was breathing, but nothing came. Nothing. No breathing, no blood pressure, no pulse. And so after two hours, they called the code, meaning they pronounced her dead. And they called the time of death. Now on that same Sunday morning, Connie's church had heard about it, and they'd heard that she'd been rushed to the emergency room and that it did not look good. And so they stopped their worship service. They just stopped their ordinary Sunday service, and they just started to pray as a family of believers interceding, intercessory prayer offered, interceding on behalf of their friend Connie. And when Connie's husband was told of the news of her death, the doctors had come out and told them that after two hours they were not able to resuscitate her. He asked the doctor if those who had gathered with him in the waiting room that morning could go in and pray for her. Now, of course, the doctor thought, well, a little too late to do the right thing now, but, you know, have at it, go on in. So the doctor said, of course, and Connie had a friend there named Thelma. And here's what Thelma had to say. She said, when I laid my hands on her, she, meaning Connie, was cold. And so I prayed this. Lord, with long life, you promised to satisfy her. Lord, you said you would do her good and not evil, that you would give her an expected end, and that your will for her is to live and not die. When Thelma finished that prayer, Connie Davis started to breathe. Her blood pressure started to climb. The doctor who had, who was just stunned, said, all I know is that the family went in, and when they came out, the nurses went back in there, and Connie was spontaneously starting to breathe again, and began feeling blood pressure, and there was a pulse again. But of course, complications lingered. The doctor went on to report, we knew Connie was brain dead when she started back. She'd had no spontaneous activity. She was on a ventilator. She had to be assisted in her ventilation. She had aspiration pneumonia, which means she had aspirated her stomach contents during CPR. Doctors went on to say we broke her ribs, her kidneys went into failure from not enough oxygen. Her GI tract went into bleeding, again from not enough oxygen. She just had every complication that you can have, the doctor said, from a cardiac arrest. 
yet 30 days later, one month, with each medical crisis followed by intense prayer sessions of her church family and friends, Connie went home. Not only did she go home, she was completely physically and neurologically healed and intact. She had come back from the dead. Now, I, I don't know Connie Davis, but I remember crying when I heard the story. And I cried because of the sheer greatness and omnipotence and sovereignty of God who had worked an incredible miracle and had saved her. And I thought to myself, God, you are so good. Praise be to God, how great thou art. In the morning, I awoke to the latest breaking story, which was that the headlines had it wrong. Instead of 12 miners surviving and one perishing, it was the exact opposite. 12 miners were dead and only one had survived. And the one survivor was clinging to life. Families and friends of those trapped underground had just traveled the most emotional roller coaster you could ever imagine in less than two days' time. I mean, it was horrible to think about. Just imagine the papers had it wrong. Everybody had it wrong. And when I heard the story for a brief moment, I said, what the chicken? What's up with that guy? How could you allow something so cruel to happen, much less be splashed across the nation and the world news, giving just more fodder to cynics and skeptics and pre-believers who have then even more reason to scoff and turn away from you? and say, well, if God is good, how could he let this happen? And as quickly as that thought slipped into my mind, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, Mary, who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Are you listening and leaning and depending on the ways and the words of the world which regularly lie to you and get it wrong? Or are you listening to the word of God which never fails, never deceives, never gives false truths, never reports in error? See, here's the thing. The fact is God never promised this life was going to be easy or problem-free. He didn't make that guarantee for those who follow him. And that's the first point in your handout. It says, in point of fact, strangely enough, it seems like the Christian walk is often the way of suffering. The Christian walk is often the way of suffering. The Apostle Peter writes this, But you must resist the devil and stay strong in your faith. You know that all over the world the Lord's followers are suffering just as you are. Here's what Jesus himself says. He says, Mark my words. No one who sacrifices house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, land, whatever, because of me and the message, will lose out. Well, they'll get it all back. But multiplied many times in homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and the land, but also in troubles. Now, that is not the greatest passage to preach on for winning souls for Jesus. Yeah, come along with me, it's the way of suffering. It's gonna be great, it's gonna be grand, it's gonna be fun. But as Christians who believe in the crucified and resurrected Christ, and this is your second fill in the blank, we're forced to look past the present troubles and forward into the future. We must look past the present troubles of today and focus forward into the future. It's what we call perspective thinking. Here's what Paul says. He says, For our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. 
So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we have not yet seen, for the troubles we see will soon be over. But the joys to come will last forever. He's talking about heaven. Yeah, these troubles, they seem long, but in, in the comparison to eternity, they are short-lived. Paul's essentially saying, hang on and hang in there. He also writes to the church in Corinth, therefore always, being always of good courage and knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home at, to be at home with the Lord. That's a scripture that I often use for those who have, who have suffered a terrible loss, who've lost a loved one, or they ask sometimes, where, are, where is my loved one? And I say, well, the Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If they're not here, if they've confessed Jesus as their Savior, they're in heaven. Where does that kind of courage come from? That courage to look futuristically. Where does that courage come from to focus forward, to see past the great pain and the heartache and the struggles of this life? It actually comes from our baptism. It comes from our baptism in which we're washed clean because it's in baptism that we receive the gift of faith and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So yesterday, I did a private baptism here. And uh, the little one, she was, she's one years old today. And uh, she, uh, it was so it was so fun because her family was here, of course, moms and dads and aunts and uncles and grandparents were here, and it was all about Lillian May. And uh, she was the, uh, you know, she was the guest of honor. Everybody was so happy. Today, today, Wyatt, Jack Gunderson, is going to reaffirm his baptismal promises. He's going to make a public profession of his Christian faith. And we're all able to be witnesses to this great day. Here's what it says from Titus. And I, I love this translation. This is from a very um, contemporary translation called The Message. He's talking about baptism. He says, he gave us a good bath. We came out of it new people washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Our Savior Jesus poured out new light so generously. God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us back our lives. And there's more life to come, an eternity of life, and you can count on this. You see, that's the beauty and blessings of baptism. It's the courage to count on eternal life and to look past the present problems of today. Even Jesus, who was born without sin, who never sinned a day in his 33 years, when he was about 30, beginning his public ministry, Jesus himself submitted to baptism. It's recorded in Mark, it says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. This is the voice of the Father, Father God our Creator. And he said, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. That's what the Father is going to say and is saying to Wyatt today. You're my son, whom I love, and with you, Wyatt, I am well pleased. Just like Jesus, all those who are baptized and confirmed are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a glorious infilling. Now, it's such, so much fun 
to do baptism, especially for the little ones, you know, because when I look out at the congregation, everybody has a smile on their face. Everybody is happy. It's almost universally the same, no matter where I go, what church I'm in. Smiles and tender tears and an inexpressible joy. Why? Because they know that they're witnessing a new birth. So Lillian May, who's celebrating her one year birthday today, she had a spiritual birthday yesterday on April 30th. And so today, when Wyatt is confirmed, he is going to re-celebrate his spiritual birthday of new birth. And so it's the beauty and the blessings of baptism and confirmation, and they're truly remarkable. Here's what Paul says. Again, this is from uh, the Message Translation. Meaning, when we went under the water, meaning when we're baptized, we left the old country of sin behind. And when we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. When we're raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. Martin Luther, who is the founder of this denomination, Lutheranism, he said, a Christian life is nothing else than a daily baptism, begun once and continuing ever after. For we must keep at it without ceasing, always purging whatever belongs to the old Adam, so that whatever belongs to the new creature may come forth. You see, every day, every day that we take a breath on this planet, we must listen as God calls us to remember the beauty and blessings of our baptism, which means we must push past the pain, past the problems of the present, to no longer stay stuck in sin, to free ourselves from fear with the power of the Holy Spirit, and then to focus on the future promise of eternal life. No matter what the emotional roller coaster of life brings us. I remember when I was going to seminary, I had a professor who said that every morning when he showered with warm water, the warm water reminded him of his baptism for which he thanked God daily. So whether it's a daily shower, you know, or you're just running late and it's a quick splash of water on your face in the morning, or maybe it's when you come home and you take a luxurious bubble bath. I want to just encourage you, let that clear, clean water remind you of this new life in Christ, this new hope, this new faith, all because of your baptism. So I would like you to take a look at the uh, prayer at the uh, back of your handout. It's called the Prayer of Affirmation of Baptism. And that's what we're going to do in just a few minutes. We're going to have Wyatt affirm his baptism in confirmation. So let's just pray that prayer together. Gracious Lord, through water and the Holy Spirit, you made us your own. You forgave our sins and brought us into the newness of life. Continue to strengthen us with your Holy Spirit and daily increase in us your gifts of grace, that we may share spirit of joy in your presence and with those who do not yet know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So at this time, I want to invite Wyatt forward, and uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to celebrate your Confirmation, which is your public declaration of baptism 